Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and for some good evening. Thanks for joining us for this webinar to discuss how child helplines can support protection of children during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Hani Mansurian, and I'm the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. Today, we are organizing this webinar in collaboration with Child Helpline International, UNICEF, and the Child Protection Area of Responsibility. Thanks for all of these groups that have come together to first develop the technical notes that we'll be discussing today, but also for making time to be here to discuss several issues related to child helplines and the protection of children with us. We'll begin with some welcome. We'll introduce all of the panelists and members of the Q&A panel at the end. Then we'll discuss the technical note itself. So we'll provide a very short overview of the technical note. We hope that you're all already familiar with it. It was uh, released a week ago. So hopefully you have had a chance to look at it. If not, we'll post the, the link for you to, to download and look at it. We'll then have three country presentations from Thailand, Jordan, and Zambia. And then we'll go into Q&A session where hopefully we'll have quite a bit of time for you guys to post questions and for panelists to respond to it. And then we'll have a few closing remarks and we say goodbye to you at that point. But just quickly to introduce all of the speakers, I would like to invite Patrick Krenz, Executive Director of Child Helpline, to, to briefly introduce yourself, Patrick. Yes, uh, thank you, Hani. Welcome, everybody, and uh, good day to all of you. Allow me to, uh, to spend a, a, a few minutes, a very short introduction of myself, being the Executive Director of Child Helpline International. Child Helpline International is an, uh, a global network of uh, helplines. We have uh, 173 members in 142 countries, so it's a rather big family. And uh, just to mention that uh, child helplines are increasingly important uh, in responding to concerns from children and uh, young people all over the world. And also that child helplines are widely recognized and that they play a crucial entry point to the child protection systems uh, that we have in place. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the child helplines, our members, um, they witness an, an increase of calls and contacts from children and youngsters. Uh, many of them are um, uh, utilizing the services that are offered. And some of our members are even um, reporting uh, a doubling of uh, their contacts. We are very proud um, uh, to be able uh, to present uh, a joint technical note, um, as uh, Hani was explaining. We uh, developed this jointly with our partners and all of us uh, underline and emphasize the core principles that go um, uh, with our work which is uh, the safeguarding and listening to children and young people and uh, really taking their concerns uh, seriously. So I really would like to uh, invite you to be part of this uh, important webinar. Um, there will be presentations, as Hani said, uh, but also the opportunity for you to ask questions. Thank you so much for now. Great. Thank you very much, Patrick. And again, for all the work that you and your team have done on the technical notes and also for this webinar. I would like to invite Ilya Smirnov, Executive Director of Child Helpline Thailand Foundation, to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. It's night in Thailand already. It's 7 o'clock at night. But good morning to those who are on the other side of the planet. Yes, I'm the Executive Director of Child Helpline Thailand, and uh, I will be introducing you to what we have done during the last few months, you know, in response and what we see from children. I would like to invite Ola Al-Omari, Child Helpline Supervisor, Jordan River Foundation, to introduce yourself, please. And hi, everybody. This is Ola Al-Omari. I'm the Supervisor of Child of the Helpline in Jordan, Jordan River Foundation. I'm happy to be with you today and share uh, with you our experience uh, during the COVID uh, period. And I will let you know and update you about our working through the last period. And happy to be with you. Thank you very much for now. Lawrence Kuwa, Executive Director of Lifeline Ch Childline Zambia. 
would you please introduce yourself, Florence? Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or, or whatever time it is. So maybe it's night for, for our friend in, in Thailand. I'm happy to be on the panel this afternoon. My name is Florence Mpua. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Lifeline Childline Zambia. Uh, we're going to share with you what we are doing during this COVID period in Mantapala. It's a refugee camp in the northern part of Zambia. I'd like to invite Chantal Newweiler, Child Protection Specialist with UNICEF, to introduce yourself, please. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Chantal Newweiler, uh, Child Protection Specialist, working with the Child Protection Area of Responsibility and the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. Uh, very happy to be here today. Uh, John? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm, my name is John Cameron. I'm the COVID-19 response consultant. I'm working currently with Child Helpline International. I've got an experience of working in a number of helplines in the UK. And I'll be facilitating the Q&A session shortly after the presentation. So uh, I'm looking forward to the range of questions and queries that you may have. And our panel will be able to respond to them. And Rocio from UNICEF. Good morning, everyone from the other side, from New York. My name is Rocio Asnar, and I work as a child protection specialist in UNICEF headquarters in New York. I've been working for over 15 years in child protection in, in UNICEF in countries such as Nigeria, Ethiopia, Indonesia, in addition to my um, experience in Human Rights Watch and UNHCR. It's really a pleasure to be um, here with you today, and I'm very excited about the release of this technical note. Thank you. And last, but definitely not the least, Michael Copeland, the Global Coordinator for the Child Protection Area of Responsibility. Michael? Thanks, Hani. And yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Really happy to join you and great to see uh, the technical note finalized and yeah, to see the focus on linking child helplines and positioning them as an integral part of interagency coordination. Uh, really, really great to see and happy to be with you. I actually don't see Helen on this, um, and I would like to ask Helen to introduce herself just because of, again, the enormous role that you played for the technical note and supporting this webinar. Thank you, Hani. Um, it's my pleasure to be online with you all today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Helen Mason, Director of Operations at Child Helpline International. Thank you. I will quickly go through the technical note itself, the structure of the technical note. Uh, but first, as, as mentioned before, I wanted to recognize that this was a collaboration across four different entities, um, the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, that does standard setting for um, child protection work, uh, particularly in humanitarian settings and fragile settings, the child protection area of responsibility that supports coordination of child protection in humanitarian settings and fragile settings, Child Helpline International, that uh, I believe a lot of you know very well, that is the authority on child helplines um, globally. And UNICEF, again, doesn't require uh, an introduction. It's the United Nations agency that, that focuses on children and the lead agency for, for child protection among UN agencies and is a great supporter, as all of you know, for uh, child helplines across the world. So this was really just basically bringing all of the important actors in this in this field together to make sure that the technical note covers all the ele necessary elements. And as Michael mentioned, bringing, for example, the issue of coordination really um, central in, into the technical note. The objectives of the technical notes were twofold. One was to provide some practical advice to child protection actors and service providers on how to support children and families through child helplines, including the issue of um, collaboration with existing helplines and national helplines. Also, it explores how existing child helplines can contribute to and, and participate in the response to, to COVID-19 specifically, because it's not that all the, all the existing child helplines are, are necessarily in, in a position to immediately switch and may need to make adjustments to both operational adjustments, but also uh, in terms of the, the training and all that. The technical note is divided into two general sections, but a theme that runs through all of the, all of the technical note, the theme of maximizing resources and, uh, and minimizing duplication. 
So you'll see all through the technical note, we keep going back to this issue of how do we make sure that the work that we are doing is not duplicating um, and using the existing resources and maximizing those. So in the first section, we talk about the organizational and coordination considerations for agencies who want to provide helpline services. In the second section, we go into operational guidance for those who are, who are actually working on child helplines. And it's a, it's a very practical, the second part is, is extremely practical. It's actually about um, how to provide the services. Within the first section, we, we talk about adapting existing child helplines and what, what are the things to consider. We talk about how to establish new child helplines. Of course, considering the, the upfront costs that, that establishing a new child helpline has and the time that it takes. And the big question that, that keeps being repeated in the, in the technical note is whether it's the right decision to establish a new one or should we try to go with existing mechanisms. And then we also, within section one, we talk about common actions for adapting existing child helpline services. And then there is a whole section towards the end of the technical note that talks about advocacy points for key partners. How do you advocate around child helplines with governments, with coordination mechanisms, with donors? Uh, so it's a very helpful tool uh, if you're planning to engage with child helplines. And as I said, the section two, or the second section of the, of the technical note is very operational. It talks about how do you provide actual uh, support by, by phone. It talks about, goes through, for example, when, how do you start the call? How do you manage a call throughout? And then how do you end the call? It talks about supervision and how supervisors can support staff. There's elements about capacity building of, of, the, uh, of the staff to make sure that we are, we are able to upskill and reskill those staff that have already been providing services to be effective in the context of COVID-19. I'll stop there again. I hope you all go to the link and, and download it and, and look at it. It's a really useful uh, resource. We try to keep it as concise as possible. It's a bit longer than we, were, we would have hoped for, but we really wanted to cover all of the key elements, um, but also recognizing that there's a lot more material that Child Helpline International has produced that some of which are referenced in this, in this technical note and others may, may even be produced in the future. So make sure that you also uh, consult the website of Child, Child Helpline International for additional resources. That is it from me on the, on the technical note. I would like to invite a colleague from Child Helpline Thailand, Ilya, to present. Thank you. If you look at the first slide, you know, this is the actual first change that we have done uh, on the basis of COVID. As you see, the first banner is our counselor and then uh, the banner at the bottom, we had to add the mask. Thailand was the second country with COVID infection uh, after China. Our first case was registered on the 13th of January. And since then, it's been kind of like sort of tightening and tightening its policies. So it did affect children in multiple ways, you know. So this was the first change we had to do in response to that. But we basically operate two projects that are complementary. We have a, a standard uh, contact center or a call center, but we also have a walk-in center for street kids, you know, because uh, there's a number of street children in Bangkok, as some of you might be aware. And uh, so you can see the little picture at the bottom is actually our walk-in center that provides direct uh, assistance to the kids in emergency. So these are the stats, you know, so these are the stats from the uh, average for the first column. It's too small, I think, for you to see for some of you. Uh, the first column on, on the left and the right is basically the average for 2019. And then you have January, you have February, you have March, and then you have April. So you can see on the left-hand side is the uh, chat and call sessions. So they are almost tripled uh, from our regular size. And, and the walk-in cases served by the walk-in center basically doubled, you know, from uh, about 100 kids that we case managed to almost 180 right now. So what have we done? 
we have responded. We try to educate the kids, educate the the public about the difficulties that COVID and the whole isolation and the whole uh, suspension of the school brings to the children. As you can see, we have this uh, many posters, you know, that explain to you how you can take care of your mental health during this time. Because as we have discovered, the majority uh, of the calls and contacts that were the increasing ones is actually about mental health. We didn't have that much increase in any other category, not even in the violence for some reason. But in terms of anxiety, worry, uh, not being sure of the situation, very, very high. As to the walk-in center, the increase was for the basic support. Uh, as you can see here, um, on the left hand side, a small picture, uh, we had a, sort of a crash course meeting with the kids before Thailand announced the emergency situation and enforced curfew because most of the kids spend their life on the streets even during the night. So curfew would have affected them negatively. Uh, so we would trying to devise a temporary kind of housing placement for each kid and try to case manage according to that. Uh, even with all our efforts, a few of them got caught and ended up in detention centers, which we had to uh, process them out and stuff. But uh, all in all, we did pretty well, you know, but uh, for anyone facing a curfew, you know, this is something to watch out. As to the basic support, because all the services immediately shut down during the, the first few weeks of the emergency situation, the emergency decree proclamation and curfew, we found ourselves being one of the only few services that still operated, you know, even though we are an NGO. We did have to partner with our government colleagues. And uh, on this slide, you actually can see in the center, there is a big government call center that they uh, unveiled for uh, COVID response. However, you know, it wasn't very child friendly and mostly managed uh, and processed the payments and the payouts, uh, incentive payouts for the, for the citizens. So the kids kind of left, were left behind still, you know, so we had our work carved out for us. Uh, but however, you see Minister of Interior, Minister of Social Development, Department of Children use they all try to keep in touch with us. They invite uh, myself to all these meetings, you know, coordination meetings, and even Ministry of Public Health eventually uh, came around and uh, they thought that we can play a big role in disseminating the correct knowledge on how to prevent and manage uh, things with children. Uh, you can find more information on the on the little <laughs> notes below this uh, little poster. And um, yeah, you, you can get in touch with me also questions and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ilya. It's very interesting to hear your adaptations uh, and response to COVID-19 through your work. I would like to invite now um, Ola from Jordan River Foundation to share her presentation with us. Hi, everybody again. Actually, I want to talk about our experience last, uh, last period in, during the COVID period. Uh, first of all, uh, the COVID period started in Jordan in, in the mid of uh, March, not in the beginning of this year. So we started the quarantine at a, a 18th of March. Uh, so we found ourselves that we have to, uh, to stay at home, start doing, uh, not working from office. And we used to work from, from the call center. We never start, uh, worked uh, from our home. So we do our uh, actions and started working from home from let's say from uh, two, uh, 22nd of March until 21st of May. This, that was the, our quarantine period uh, during the COVID uh, period. So we started at that time. Let's talk about the helpline first. We launched about 2007 and our helpline is concerned about uh, families and their children. It belongs to Georgia River Foundation. Uh, and I want to talk now about our period during the COVID. We started, actually, we used to work in the office with uh, about four specialists. But uh, in the COVID, we found that we need more specialists to work with. So we started off with 21 specialists working from our home, uh, receiving the calls, uh, divided in three shifts a day, every shift about four hours. And every shift, there was about five counselors receiving the call at the same time. We're receiving the calls from three networks, from Zen, Orange, and Omnia. If I want to talk about the, uh, our pathways, how to receive the calls, we receive the calls 
and we deal with the call in two ways. First way, we take our action from our side, uh, the specialist deal with the case if the key, if the case needs uh, support from the specialist, like uh, family issues, like uh, parenting issues, like uh, uh, academic issues, uh, mental health, any calls we receive during this period deal with these cases. There are another cases need to be referred to other services to take the service that they want or they ask for, like protection cases, like severe mental health cases, like legal cases. Actually, we were, uh, what we deal, we were doing two ways of, in, of referred, internally referred and externally referred. The internally referred that the cases need to be uh, supported by mentally health support. So we were uh, like uh, refer internally to the case management team and they take their action. If the, if the case need to be referred or need to be pro like protection uh, services or legal services, we were uh, refer the cases externally from our team, the helpline team and follow up for the case until uh, to make sure that the case uh, took all the service that they asked for. If I want to talk about our partnership or our partners, during the period, during the COVID period, the helpline was supported by UNHCR and UNICEF. And as you see, UNICEF and UNHCR supported the helpline uh, to operate remotely during the COVID period with 15,000 JD. And UNHCR now provides additional support with 40 to 42,000 until the end of this year. And also the UNICEF will support us about uh, 32,000 uh, JD uh, for the next three months. Also, if we just propose to the OCHA, I think we have a good uh, negotiation uh, to also to support us uh, from three to six uh, next month. If I want to share you about uh, the statistics for the helpline, uh, during the COVID period, we received around 1,258 calls. Most of the callers were, we noticed they were from the adults. Most of them, uh, them yeah, they were from the adults because we, you know, the quarantine came very suddenly. And the first two weeks, most of the callers, they called, they are asking for uh, the basic needs actually like food, like medicines. So they were asking for that, how to uh, support their families about these issues. Most of the callers, they are from females, not the males. We noticed in the first two weeks that, as I said, most of the callers asking the basic needs. But after that, they are started to call about like mental health, about parenting skills, about to call about uh, some domestic violence, and we found that there is some increases of the domestic violence and the, of the domestic violence cases during that time. And uh, most of the callers, they were, the nationality were from uh, Jordan. And they are uh, talking from the biggest caller, they were from Amman, the big city or the capital of Jordan. If I want to talk about the challenges at that time, I think we discussed it before in the last meeting, there is a lot of uh, challenges about the other services that we provided during the COVID. As you know, there is, was a quarantine and there was a very limited that uh, can provide the uh, services to the callers or to the people. So we found a very difficult to find another services that gonna provide the, uh, for the external referral to, to support us. So like legal, issue, legal uh, services or protection services. But I think uh, now because the quarantine is over and everything is, go, is returned back to the normal, I think we're gonna start to follow up all for all the cases that we received last period and until to make sure that we, go, we are going to take the right service or the uh, needed service that they are asking for. That's all what I have now. If you have any questions, I'm happy to hear from you. And that's it. Great. Thank you very much, Ola. This was really, really interesting. And as you were speaking, also when Ilya was speaking, I, I kept remembering different parts of the technical notes. So a lot of the issues that you brought up, for example, the, the work that you did on um, increasing the capacity and making sure that the shifts are covered. 
Yeah. Um, all of all of those are some of the challenges that you mentioned. They're all, again, in very brief form. Uh, we have tried to ad address or provide some suggestions um, in the technical note. So mm -hmm. hopefully it will be it will be helpful. But thanks for sharing your experience. Um, I would like to now hand over to Florence, who will be talking about Childline in Zambia. Florence. Thank you for having me. My name is Florence Chileshenko. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Lifeline Childline Zambia. So I'll just highlight a few activities that we're doing during this COVID-19 response. A Lifeline Zambia is a helpline that offers 24 counseling on the three networks that we have in Zambia, which are MTN, Airtel, Zamtel, and is also being supported by the government through our regulator, uh, Zambia Information, Communication and Technology Authority, ZICTA, which have uh, accorded this number zero rated and uh, the one has to pay for the line. It's basically an emergency line. So we are providing psychosocial support for COVID-19 affected children and parents through the telephone services and online chat services and social media comprehensive phone, internet, physical counseling, and referral on COVID-19 support, which is supported by the UNICEF, UNICEF Zambia, Save the Children, the European Union, Plan International, and the World Bank. Awareness raising through radio, TV programs, community sensitization, and marketing the 116 and the 933 top free lines on the billboard flyers and posters and change with child-friendly IC materials. On those, we raise awareness of the COVID-19, how to take care of themselves during this period. We're also working with the Ministry of Health. We are supporting children who have been placed in quarantine with uh, psychosocial support, uh, We're also giving them toys and recreation activities under the funding from UNICEF. I'd like to say that the Ministry of Health has been supportive with the helpline that uh, we reach out to the children and uh, so that they don't feel left out during the, uh, this period, especially those children that are under quarantine. Like I mentioned, we have strategic partners with relevant government ministries, which are the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Development and Social Welfare. The Lifeline Childline Zambia has been authorized by the Ministry of Health to support in responding to COVID-19. The Ministry of Health has their own number, 909, which they are responding to, but they've also authorized the helpline to respond to COVID-19 through, through the 116 number. So the, the top three numbers that are being utilized are the 933, which is which we call our gender-based violence line and the 116 child protection line. So those both numbers are advertised on the billboards as COVID-19 information provision and assistance centers. Uh, furthermore, we were also on radio and TV and showing highlights of our COVID-19 responses. This marketing of the top free lines has seen an increase in the number of calls from previously silent remote districts. These are just some of the districts that are in the rural areas uh, in Masabombe, Lunga, Porokoso, just to mention a few. We have also partnered with grassroots organizations who are also distributing flyers containing the 933 and 116 child helpline numbers. With support from uh, UNICEF Zambia, Lifeline Childline Zambia has been providing psychosocial support to children and women at the camp. This is a refugee camp in Mantapala. So I'm just sharing what we're doing with the refugees who we haven't left out in this COVID period. We have also been supporting the youth center at the camp to keep the youth actively involved in the activities in the camp. With support from UNICEF, we have provided protective personal equipment to our counselors at the camp who keep on providing psychosocial support to children and the parents at the camp. And also scaling up awareness raising and information dissemination on COVID-19 at the camp with support from UNICEF. 
Thank you very much. This is what uh, a few things that I've been doing during this COVID response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florence, for sharing your experience. Particularly wanted to note that it seems that you have done a, quite a bit of coordination with government in terms of the connections you have established and, and other actors, which is again, one of those areas that has been emphasized in the technical note. Without further ado, I would like to hand over to John to walk us through the Q&A session. Over to you, John. Thank you, Hani, and uh, Ilya, Ola, and Florence. Thanks very much for those um, presentations. I think what it demonstrates is that helplines are under increasing demands um, from children as the risks um, begin to escalate and as humanitarian organizations will understand that perfectly well as well. Um, as a result of the isolation and social distancing, I think we recognize that accessibility for services um, to help to uh, improve the lot for children is absolutely important. And that's where helplines fit in terms of improving reach. And we've seen through, I think all three of those presentations, very helpful ideas and practices that not only reach out to children, um, but also form very, very important relationships, which the technical note, both in terms of reaching out to children, delivering services and having those relationships, as Annie was saying right at the very beginning, um, help to guide agencies and helplines and how they can work further together. I, I, I think there's potentially um, three overarching themes that come out both from the technical note and again, um, emphasized in the three presentations. One is around um, a coordination theme. How can humanitarian organizations effectively work together to utilize their collective resources to ensure that we minimize duplication and galvanize partners into working together to maximize um, helpline services? Um, how do we prioritize what we actually do deliver on and make sure that we can promise on any delivery? So there's, a, there's the coordination queries and questions that we might well have. There's an element of support here and some of the thoughts that you might have on how we can support each other, um, both in advocating for children and making sure that we provide direct services to protect children. And again, ensuring that we can meet the needs, not only of children and the communities, but also the individuals that actually deliver um, services as well, uh, indeed our practitioners. And I think the third theme over and above coordination and support is how we make adaptations, particularly in this pandemic, things are moving very, very quickly. Um, and there is a requirement, I think, in terms of the partnership relationships between humanitarian organizations, government agencies, and helplines, and how, how they make major adaptations, increase the awareness of the services that are available to those who are at risk of harm, and how effective that we can be in terms of maintaining our accessibility and that overall um, awareness as well. So, uh, questions. I wonder whether that if I can um, uh, put, say, to my panel then, um, what they think are the major challenges that they think that they are facing in terms of potentially um, engaging with helpline partners and um, utilizing those services. Yes, thank you. And in fact, I, I believe there is a related question from, from Lucia uh, on this. And I think one of the challenges she's raising is um, the existence of different hotlines and the child hotlines and then the government services. So I do think that the technical note tries to address um, the issues of coordination that are definitely very important, a very important challenge. And in fact, I do believe that COVID-19 may offer an opportunity to address some of the long-standing issues. So what the note basically says is that we should advocate with the government so that um, the chat headlines are declared and recognized as essential services and as such to be included in any COVID-19 and child protection coordination body at national level. And along with the child headlines, also other hotlines that are in existence and jointly conduct an, an impact assessment to understand how the containment measures have impacted the services of the hotlines, of the child helplines, but also the essential child protection services. And as such, together, 
come up with uh, or review existing referral protocols. Um, and I think Lucia specifically speaks about the, the need to clarify what would be the key pathway to identify, report, and, and refer cases of child protection to the child protection authorities. So I do think that the technical note provides some guidance on it. And it is very important that the government and the child protection authorities leads this process, includes the child headlines and the other headlines to come up with an updated um, referrals SOPs. So I think that is one key um, challenge I see consistently, but I think the COVID-19 provides an opportunity to address it. Thanks, John. So there's um, one question here from Sharalanga. I think it's how you pronounce it. How could a child uh, liner maintain social distancing and other safe measures while helping any child in crisis as it might be troublesome for both and vice versa? It's really challenging pra practically on the ground. So this is a, a social distancing issue, obviously helplines which are providing um, online and telephone um, support is not an issue. But when you are having closer working relationships, um, there are major challenges. I wonder, Michael, whether or not you want to um, pick that up as a, as a response in the first instance. Yeah, sure. Maybe, maybe a couple of things. To Rossio, linking with Rossio's point on connecting the different kinds of services. So those services which may be remote, then how do they link with what would have been in-person case management services? So what we've seen in a couple of instances is trying to adapt case management services to be more online or remote. So then how would we work with helplines to be part of that process and coordinated process where face-to-face -face services may not always be possible. Um, but in terms of the distancing and social distancing and safe practices, what we do know is that child protection services are life-saving and we need to advocate with governments and partners so that child protection actors have protective safety equipment, are able to go out and provide um, in-person services for those cases which are, are high priority and critical, but they need to be linked with the overall package of service provision. Services need to be mapped and um, child helplines need to be need to be part of that process. I think that's that's the critical point and that's the opportunity I think Rossio is mentioning um, that we're seeing really that with COVID-19, how can we bring the child helplines consistently in all of our settings into the service mapping and the planning for the response uh, as well. So they're an integral part of that. Thank you. So there is a question from um, Pamela. Pamela Gurdy, who is a GBB area of responsibility for Asia and Pacific, sharing emerging good practices and lessons learned. How can we actually do that and how we can be consistent in, in the provision of the sharing of good practices? So that there's one thing, I think CHI can form a very important role in terms of ensuring that um, helplines, as they develop good practices and be able to evidence them, and share them both geographically and locally um, with other agencies and indeed across health lines. I wonder though, well, Roshi and Michael, whether or not you have got any um, ideas about how we can begin to disseminate good practices as they emerge during the pandemic and post-pandemic? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. And actually I was gonna also suggest maybe Florence will, will come in because we do have some country specific good examples where that coherence and the links between child protection and GBV service providers are, are, are in place. So I think we've got we've got a lot to learn. I think a couple of a couple of points on on the connections. One is understanding who would access which service. So if we think about um, teenage girls and boys, would they would they access GBV services or child protection services? And if there's a a child helpline and then a GBV helpline as well. Um, again, coming back to that mapping of services and understanding which cases would go where, but also the protocols around handling specific kinds of cases, but then also having the staff with the right capacity to handle different sorts of cases, having male staff, female staff, and so on. But as I understand it, we've actually got a good example in Zambia. So with your permission, John, maybe maybe Florence would like to yes. speak as well. Florence? Thank you. For Zambia, we are running two, two helplines. One is called the 9, 933 Gender-Based Violence Line. 
and the 116 uh, child helpline. The 116 child helpline uh, is for children from 1 to 18 and, on, and also for adults calling on behalf of the children and also children of themselves calling the helpline. And then we also have the 933 gender-based violence where mostly the adults do call that line. We only have one call center and the counselors are all trained in, in, in different areas. So we have an in-house referral system in that if uh, a child or a young person uh, needs to talk to uh, something to do with uh, the child helpline, they are the ones that pick up uh, the, the, those phones. And the, the 933 also have adults calling on that line. But just to say that in this period of COVID, we have opened up the lines for everyone to call because we've realized that the call center is receiving a number of calls. So we're not uh, restricting the, the children to just call 116 and also the adults to call 933. But in-house, we're able to speak to the children and the, and the adults in the same call center. Because what we realize that if we just tell them call 116 and it's they can't get through, then they won't get the desired information which uh, they're supposed to get. If at all the, the children do call on 933 and uh, we, we feel that it's something not to do with COVID, then uh, we'll still speak to them, but uh, encourage them that, okay, this time we've got them through the 933 number, but next time you call us on the 116 number so that it's uh, recorded as having your call come through the 116 number, the child helpline. So we're able to manage the two and the in-house referral is also done within counselors who are specialized in different areas uh, within the system. So if one is specialized in issues of uh, child protection, they'll get to answer the phone and that's how the in-house uh, works. Thank, thank you, Florence. Um, we, we, we've got a, a question here. I'm not quite certain who it's from, but it, it, it raises the question about the data that child helplines have and how that can be used to improve accessibility of services and also preventing violence against children. Um, Florence, I'll, I'll bring you in as a, a helpline operative at the moment, but from our position, from Child Helpline International, essentially helplines have the finger on, uh, on the pulse of what children are saying and what's actually happening to them at the moment. And I think it's really helpful that that data, when it is shared with governments, that they have an understanding of what actually children are talking about. I don't know, Florence, whether or not you can make any additional comments in terms of how you potentially use the data that you have, you believe goes on to influence um, governments in terms of how they might be able to respond to children at risk. So in terms of data collection, I'll pick up maybe just a few. If we see that uh, there are so many calls coming in of child abuse in a certain province, or maybe say they're talking about HIV in a certain province, the data that is collected, we then um, share it with the government that in this area, there's a lot of abuse which is going on, maybe a lot of child uh, marriage cases. We can talk about maybe trafficking. Then the government will would take keen interest in that data and also maybe say, let's go to that province and see why are there a lot of child marriages in this area? What is happening? Then thereafter, they, they'll take up. So just don't receive the, the, the data on the calls and then pack them up. If we see a trend in a certain province or a trend in a certain uh, cases that are being constantly being reported, we then share them with the government and the cooperating partners that this is the trend that we have. In this time, we also had a lot of child labor in that so many children are not, uh, all the children are, uh, are not going to school. They're just in the, at home and, and hence, instead of studying because they don't have computers, so they, they can't study online. So what would, the, what would they do is just to, maybe go and start working when they're not supposed to do. Those are the things that we share with the government that in this area, there are so many things that are happening and then the government will take it up and the cooperating partners. In short, the data is shared according to the, the, the calls that we're receiving so that 
government and the cooperating partners should take it up. Thank you very much, Florence. That was that was um, very helpful indeed. The uh, next question is coming from Bitia, I think it is, and that's a question for Michael. Gender-based violence and child protection subsectors, how do we provide um, services to children and survivors of uh, gender-based violence? So it's a question around collaboration efforts between GBV and child protection. Um, Michael, I wonder if you've got any thoughts about how those subsectors can collaborate together. In terms of the collaboration, we, we've heard about the referrals between child protection and, and, and GBV and having uh, having protocols. So one of the things that we've, we've seen globally is having shared referral pathways across child protection and GBV. Not having parallel referral pathways is, is critical. And that's that's based on a, a shared service mapping as well. So coming back to the point around the helplines where we may have a GBV or a child helpline, that they're part of that comprehensive service mapping and then referral pathway so that that's, that's done together. Also, just to say who does what in, in particular context is going to vary based on the capacity of different partners there. Um, so there needs to be a, a collective assessment uh, around that capacity and then looking at um, who would be able to, to deliver which services by geographical location, by the capacity or the presence of, of, of child protection or GBV actors. What we know is that for teenagers, if we don't simply make assumptions that they are being provided services, we know that um, teenagers may then not go to services for children or sometimes for uh, adult GBV services. So it needs a concerted effort and, and similarly for boys uh, as well. So it needs we need to look at who would be accessing which service uh, as well. Thanks, Michael. I, I've got a question here from Addis from Facebook, uh, UNICEF Ethiopia. Um, how do we measure psychological support, uh, particularly remotely? But I also think that's a question that we can think about. Well, how do we measure overall the effectiveness of support that we provide children via helplines and indeed face to face as well? I mean, helplines, of course, are challenged by the anonymity often of callers coming through and the difficulties of doing follow up work. Um, a lot of the focus that we do in helplines is getting to understand children's perception of the problem as they come in versus the perception of the problem as they move out of the conversation that they have with us. This is a measure of a change in how they're thinking about the threat and what they potentially are able to do. And also we um, measure the effectiveness of the support that we provide by obviously them understanding the risks that they have to themselves, what the services might well be available and indeed providing them with um, ideas about how they can respond to any threats that are, are coming through at the moment. But there is a major challenge, I think it's fair to say, with at distance services about how you seek to measure more precisely the, the effectiveness of psychological support in terms of long-term safeguarding and protection of children. Um, I don't know if our other colleagues, Roshi or Michael, want to come in in terms of at how they uh, measure effectiveness within the more of a fieldwork setting. Yeah, just a quick thought. I, it, it's always a challenge getting feedback, not just on the coverage, but the quality or the impact of, of, of the service. I think it, Raises also a question about how, at the moment with COVID-19, we're increasingly looking to child helplines, not just for those services, but to also understand what's going on with children. So thinking about children's voice and participation and how we would normally hear that voice. And that's normally from face-to-face -face interaction. So I think it's also a question of child helplines playing that role and the support they may need to play that role in fostering participation and and, and elevating that voice of children, what they're, what they're seeing. But happy to hear from, hear from others as well. Okay, well, we have, uh, uh, Ilya, there's, there's a question for you. Um, we've got um, um, Mohammed Khan, um, who's uh, Ghana UNICEF, particularly interested in what children are actually flagging on calls at the moment. What's the biggest increase in terms of the issues that they're facing? And are children uh, reporting violence and abuse 
either to helplines, but also do you get a kind of sense that they're also speaking to other agencies on the ground as well? Well, in terms of violence, yeah, let me start from the from the end and come back to the uh, to the beginning. In terms of violence, they definitely experience, but um, I, I don't think Thailand is a good country to measure violence reporting. You know, vi violence is uh, historically underreported here, you know, and kids usually have very high tolerance for violence. So uh, with the parents being at home, you know, uh, locked down and then the kids being there as well. So there is a lot of violence, but luckily, or how would you say it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't go overboard, you know. So it, it's kind of like it's increased levels of regular violence that they're already subjected to. So uh, kids don't see it as much of a problem. They are more affected by the emotional violence, uh, by the dismissals, the parents doing their own thing, parents being stressed out, not having the time. We see a lot of family relationship problems and uh, subsequent uh, mental health deterioration of the child, you know, a low self-esteem, not really fitting anywhere, not really knowing what to do. When is this situation going to end? I wish I can go to school, see my friends and stuff like that. So uh, emotional violence, definitely there. Isolation, definitely there. Just the whole range of mental uh, health issues, you know, including anxiety about the future and not being able to perform in a different uh, way, anxiety about uh, online studying and all other stuff. You know, a lot of a lot of mental issues. Right. And and do you think that they are those who are using helpline services? Do you think they are in communication with other? agencies on the ground from what we see from the chat sessions uh they try to reach out but they don't get the support that they are looking for a lot of them actually just want somebody that will listen to them for an hour you know for them just talking it through because our counseling model like most of the helplines is based on the you know assessment of this uh, of the skills of the child and their context our counselors are trained to be patiently listening attentively listening and examining what this child telling them. And it seems like at least from the chat sessions, because we can record the feedback, you know, at the end of the chat, you know, where a child definitely uh, make a statement of some kind of sentiment uh, after the counseling session, we see that they really appreciate just somebody patiently listening to them and, you know, working together on a solution. Usually the kid's kind of aware of what the solution needs to be. They just need to talk it through. And, and Florence, I wonder whether or not you can come in here if I if I can ask you in terms of giving a little more illustration about some of the really high level um, issues that children are actually talking about. You did mention it slightly in your presentation, but do you think that there's um, one specific concern that registers with you and your practitioners that you think is beginning to disproportionately escalate during this pandemic? There are two things that are uh, constantly coming in. One is um, they just want to go back to school. They are so tired of staying at home. So they keep on calling the helpline uh, that they want to go back to school and uh, the dangers of uh, COVID if they went back to school. So they're in between going back to school and also they're also afraid of getting COVID when they get, they get back to school. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, there's also some of them are facing uh, emotional and physical violence because of staying at home. So those three I would mention are the highest on the helpline during this period. Thank you, Florence. That's Thank really you. helpful. There's a question from Charlotte Lancaster. Um, I'm not quite certain where you are, Charlotte, um, or, or what organisation you represent, but it's an interesting one about um, accessibility for people with disabilities and how we engage with children and the phone obviously can have restrictions now there are a number of helpline services across the world that have multi-channeled accessible points charlotte from uh, self-service websites to chat um, as well as voice and there are indeed some services that provide signing opportunities through a skype type of um, operation but um, children with disabilities clearly are at as more risk than children who do not have disabilities. Uh, an example is that deaf children, for instance, are three times more likely to be abused than hearing children. I wonder if my other colleagues on the, on the, on the panel can talk about um, some of the issues that they think that they are facing in terms of engaging with children with disabilities 
on the ground and the potential use of uh, helplines to to support them as well. Florence, again, I'll go back to you if I may put you on the spot. Yeah, in terms of reaching out to children who are, who've got disabilities, we're still doing the face to face, reaching out to them where they, where they are found. They, they can also call the helpline, but uh, we do reach out to them and uh, continue to, to provide the service to them. So we haven't let them out. If you saw in uh, also the presentation, the, um, the counselors are equipped with uh, protective clothing so that they, they do continue to go out in the community and reach out to the hard to reach and those that don't have phones. So that includes the disability also. Okay, and, and, and Ola, if you're um, available, are you able to give a kind of sense of how you might be able to currently you know, reaching out to children who may have disabilities and finding perhaps the telephone as a, as a, a challenge? Yes, John. I think the disability children, they are very important people and uh, they are depending on the case actually and why they are calling. Some of them they are calling, they need financial aid. Some of them they are calling because they have like problems how to deal with the, with the society or how to deal with other people and how the other people accepted them. Some of them they are asking some parents, they are calling, they are asking for the services that to support the parents, they have to deal with their, with their kids. So I think they are very important to deal with them. We don't receive uh, many, a lot of calls about disabilities, but what I can ask, uh, answer about uh, the cases that we received before, there are, we have an agreement with the Ministry of Social Development that the service was uh, responsible to deal with the disabilities. Many of the cases, they are uh, calling for financial aid, actually, uh, not more than that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Ali, thank you. Roshia, there's a question from Muninun. I hope that's how I pronounced it correctly, uh, Nessa. Um, she wants to know how children of who are in quarantine get access to helplines and how health ministries can play a, a coordinating role. Have you got any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Muminun, for the question. I think it's very important. We all recognize that children during the lockdown and stay at home uh, period or phases are cut off from their friends, their peers, and also their external adults. So I think it's, first of all, very important that the children are aware of the service to start with. And then the note is very clear on the call we make to different line ministries, including health, so that, first of all, um, social workers should know about the services and should be providing the information about the number and how to access through their own services. The Ministry of Health should also include in the public health messaging information about the child child headline and, and how to access it. And also, you know, the public spaces in health, primary health centers and other public uh, spaces such as pharmacies, uh, supermarkets, uh, police stations. We know that even during the lockdown, families still have access to certain certain services. So it's important, it's publicly uh, visible, the number, and also it's in the media within the messaging, basically on COVID-19 and public health. And the Ministry of Education also plays a very important role because many children, as we know, in a way or in another, learning from home. So there is a clear call in the note for Ministry of Education to continue providing counseling services and through the online learning, try to stay in touch with children and provide also the information on the child lines to children. And finally, I think there's also a call to use other formats um, for children to be able to access the line. It, if it not be safe on a call to explore texting, emails, messaging, and other forms of, of contact. And in that it's important to collaborate with the ICT companies, social media companies, and mobile operators to support during these important times, the child helplines to extend uh, the ways of reaching out to children. But first of all, children need to understand and need to know about the services. So the promotion is very important. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rashi. That, that was really helpful. Um, here's an interesting question from v Valerie. It's about gender and um, boys and girls using helpline services. How do we ensure that boys and girls have the equal opportunity and the, the propensity to use um, helplines? And a, a general question that follows on from that, from her, about how we engage with children 
and so that they can participate in helping to shape up services. I think this is a question for helplines and also for um, frontline services as well. Can I start, Michael, um, can, can you give me some thoughts about how potentially humanitarian organisations might well usefully engage with children so those children can advise those organisations, if you've got any examples, on how they shape up service delivery? Yeah, great. Thanks. It's a, re it's a really good question. So it's back, back to the point around participation and what, what we see is that, yes, there's efforts being made uh, for children to participate in telling their story, in understanding what the needs are, but these tend to be limited or one-off. Um, so we may see a focus group discussion to understand what needs are. And of course, those focus group discussions now may be more challenging. So they need to adapt those to, for, to online platforms, for ex example, or with social distancing. The difficulty is we need to listen to children, not just to understand the needs at a certain point in time, but in an ongoing way. But then also when we're designing the program, is it, is it the right sort of program? But then also to get the feedback coming to the question around psychosocial support as well. Is it making a difference or, or not? So we do see really good practices where children's clubs and youth clubs are given the support and training and capacity to become advocates, to do their own analysis and provide feedback. We've got some very, very good examples from, um, from partners, for example, in Central African Republic that we're able to, able to share. I guess the challenge, uh, two challenges, one, for that to be done consistently so for for colleagues to to have the capacity to 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 take on that work and for it to become an integral part of what we do but for COVID-19 for, for that to be done um, safely and, and in an adapted way also working together with the child helplines so as I understand it we do have child helplines that are also proactively reaching out to understand what those needs are so how do we work together again if we've got collective interagency effort to understand those needs. How do we work with child helplines in that process? Thank you, Michael. Child participation, I think, is absolutely essential. You can't shape services if you take it from an adult perspective. You have to have a, an input um, from children. Um, certainly my experience of working with helplines in the UK, boys are less familiar or um, confident in having real-time conversations um, I've certainly noticed that boys are more likely to use chat than girls. Girls are more likely to use um, voice and their particular um, subject areas that boys want to um, avoid. I wonder if I can bring in Florence in the first instance. Florence, have you got any examples of how you might engage with children um, to help shape your services? Thank you, John. We usually reach out to them in the schools and we talk about our service. Then we get feedback of how they feel we should improve and how can, they can get involved in the, in the services. We also have what we call friendly corners during the outreach or when we get to them. They help us shape of where we're doing good or where we think that we haven't done okay. So most of the time we try and get as much as in, a lot of information for them. If they feel that uh, they can only, uh, we should introduce the WhatsApp or maybe other forms of communication apart from just the phone. It's them, they are the ones that have actually said, I prefer texting, or mm -hmm. I prefer to do a, a, a WhatsApp, or I prefer talking on, on chat, or I prefer just phones. So those are the kind of chat participation that has shaped our, our helpline. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Um, Ola, uh, I wonder if I could bring you in here in terms of boys and girls in usage of helpline services. Ola, uh, do you find that there's a difference um, in terms of use of uh, helpline services by gender? Um, what do you think some of the issues might be for boys as well as girls? Yeah, actually, as you said in our statistics, there was uh, the females, they are looking to the helpline more than the boys. Actually, I think uh, we need to do more, uh, I think we need to focus on the boys more than the girls at the, the next step for us. Because uh, sometimes the girls uh, shy to talk loudly about their problems. So they, they, they look into the child helpline to talk more openly about their issues more than the boys. This is 
some reasons how uh, we can say why the colors comes from the girls more than the boys. Uh, but I think next step we need to focus on that and actually because the COVID-19 we, we were uh, like uh, to announce uh, through some awareness lectures about the helpline to the schools but now we don't have schools who are in summer vacation and COVID-19 we can't uh, focus on the schools so I think we need to think about that as I said before uh, John because of our culture most of the girls they are shy to talk about their problems so there is their problems face to face so they they go to the helpline Thank you very much, Ali. That, that's that, that's helpful. Um, I've got a question, Michael. Uh, if you could take up from Mandarian, um, she asks about adaptations that um, organisations can make, collaborating agencies can make when working with helplines, particularly to look at new child protection issues that are arising in uh, the, during the pandemic. Have you got any thoughts about? adaptations that agencies on the ground might be able to make that can link into how my support yeah a couple of, a couple of thoughts some good examples we've got are coordination groups coming together to agree on what are the priority cases so they may be new kinds of cases so in some instances we've seen children who, who may be living and working on the street are particularly at risk at the moment or children in institutions, for example, and others. Um, but a collective agreement to prioritise cases and then to advocate together uh, for those cases to be to be part of part of essential essential services. In terms of adaptations, we see at country level response plans being adapted. So the response plan for everyone being adapted. And we've got some really great examples where child helplines are central to those response plans, one for Democratic Republic of Congo, where there is the child helpline is actually part of the application for resources uh, in that response plan, um, which is which is being adapted. There are many and we can share we can share after the uh, webinar many of the resources and, and uh, examples together with colleagues from the Alliance we've put together on those adapted kinds of programming, whether that's from online remote psychosocial support case management that we've we've mentioned um, and on and on we can we can share those with, with everyone there's a, a good set of um, resources thank you very much Michael and, and before I close I've just got one more question from Russia Selogovic, um, who talks about well what are the innovative practices that child helplines can use to increase the effectiveness to the COVID-19 response I, I think really uh, in this situation, our experience is that um, children, when they're in lockdown and they're socially isolated, there's an uncertainty about who they should reach out to and how they should reach out. Um, I think the key issue here is how we ensure that we promote our services that are available at also an early stage when children are beginning to feel uncomfortable and beginning to start having crises or concerns about their welfare. Often children are, are anxious about speaking out, feel that they're either it's an imposition and of course they're getting a major message about socially isolating and keeping locked down. So there is a, I think an understandable resistance to call out, but we are seeing with that an increase. My worry is that there are still plenty of children out there though who are still reluctant to engage with services on the ground in the outlines. So one of the innovative practices is to make sure that we push out messaging very, very clearly to target those hard to engage um, children. And I think the other thing that we need to do is to make sure that our practitioners are au fait with some of the psychological implications of being isolated for children and what it means for those children and their belief systems around what threats around at the moment and also for their futures. We often think about the current pandemic, but there is, of course, life beyond this pandemic where we have we will have post-pandemic anxieties um, that children will have. So it's about equipping practitioners with a better understanding of the psychological impacts of lockdown and social isolation in particular um, for children in the future. Thank you very much for all the questions that you have. And before I hand over to um, Hanny to say um, final words and, and, and indeed anybody else who might want to um, sum up. Thank you very much for all the
contributors all the questions. I'll leave it by saying thank you very much for your time. Um, all the very best. It's a very, very difficult time for agencies on the ground and indeed helplines. I'm confident that partnership relationships like this will make a real substantive difference to children and the risks that they're facing now and indeed in the future. Um, I wonder whether I can um, now hand back to um, Hanny. Thank you very much, John, for your masterful facilitation of the Q&A. But special thanks goes to all of those that are providing these services in the field, both through helplines and through a direct service provision. Uh, kudos to all of you guys to, to be supporting children in these very difficult times. We hope this webinar has been helpful. Thanks to everyone. Um, Patrick, did you have any last words to say before we close? Yes, also uh, from, from my side, a, a big thank you to all the people that made this possible, uh, the creation of the technical note, of course, uh, really a great joint effort. We do hope that uh, many practitioners profit from it, not only the helplines. Thank you so much for now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. you so much. Bye-bye. Well done, everybody. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Bye. Good Bye. See you.